Saturday, it's Scotland, and it's 1pm. And that means that we're back in original form, the legible, credible, inevitable storm, which is a force for good, and our Saturday street stall. Coming to you live from our nerve centre here in the great British city of Glasgow. With me, your host, Alistair McConaughey. And we're broadcasting live on Facebook and it's great to see all the people coming in on Twitter as well. Because last Saturday's broadcast has gone extremely well by the way, and it's created a bit of a stir on Facebook, I'm very pleased to say, and also on Twitter. And somebody cut out a one-minute section from last week's broadcast, and they put it out on Twitter, and the Scottish Nationalist picked up on it, and it's had well over 100,000 views. And so we're getting a message out there. And we were also retweeted by uh, uh, somebody who's got a big following of half a million people. Uh, so we're very pleased with that. So we were really being able to push out our message and we're continuing to do so. This is our 18th Saturday Street Stall, which just tells us all the value of stick to it ifness. Stick to it ifness. Just keep doing something on a regular basis and it mounts up. And in fact, you could say the same about the British government in Scotland. When it stopped doing things as the British government on a regular basis in Scotland, it lost the practice of it. And when you lose the practice of it, you lose the relevancy of it and then you have to fight to keep your authority. And that's what we've witnessed here in Scotland through all these years of devolution. The British government, which used to be central to everybody's lives, has become something that has been displaced and devolved out to the point where it struggles now for relevancy. It struggles for authority because it's lost the relevancy because it's lost the practice of what it did. And we'll develop that idea later on in the broadcast when we talk about, we'll go back to Boris's trip here to Scotland as well. And we'll talk about that in more depths. Uh, Alan saying, making a comment on the new hairstyle. Well, thank you very much for that, Alan. Um, we did decide after taking several uh, points of view on the matter that we would go into town and we would get our hair cut. And we were in town yesterday. It was a very nice day here in Glasgow. And I have to say, even the COVID town lockdown, uh, there was still a lot of people, more people than I've ever seen out in Glasgow yesterday. And maybe that was just because of the weather. I don't know. But the shopping experience still remains extremely strained and actually rather unpleasant. So I feel for these shops, they're just obeying the law, they're doing what they have to do, I understand that. But it's a pretty strained and generally unpleasant experience to have to go into a shop and uh, to follow the, the signs and to have somebody telling you to wear a mask and all that sort of stuff. So it's, it's going to be difficult for the country really to bounce back from this, but let's hope that something will occur that will allow it to do so because we can't simply go on like this. I will give one piece of advice though to people who have shops. I know you have to put a bloke or a girl on the door now to tell people when they come in that they have to wear a mask, but don't put that person inside the door frame because he or she is not a bouncer, okay? If you put them inside the door frame of your shop, it will stop people coming into your shop because you're literally blocking the door, okay? So stand to the side of the door. That's a little bit more welcoming. Uh, that's something that we noticed uh, the, the people on the door hadn't really been taught to do. Um, I'm trying to get into a cafe. I'm not trying to get into an underground uh, bare knuckle boxing contest okay 
so you don't need to a bouncer standing in the door frame just put them a little bit to the side so that the customer can literally walk into your shop just a wee bit of advice there take it or leave it um, but otherwise otherwise it's still a strained situation out there in COVID lockdown town. Um, one slightly, perhaps, piece of uh, uh, something on the horizon that perhaps might uh, bode wet better for us. The opposition parties here in Scotland have started have started to actually complain about Nicola Sturgeon's daily party political broadcast, which has been going on for goodness knows when. And this week in the, the newspapers, we saw several headlines such as Tories want BBC to axe Sturgeon briefings. Well, it's about time, quite frankly, that came out 28th of July. You know, maybe you should have been saying that back in March because she has now had three or so months simply to to posture on the television every single day even when the British government ended their regular broadcasts she was still at it of course she's still going to be at it if you give her a platform she will stand on that platform for all eternity um, totally just she will just totally use it because she knows it's going to benefit her in the run-up to next year and she'll be on that platform daily if the bbc give her a give her the platform she'll be on that until may next year when she is hoping to uh win the hollywood election so you have to take that broad that platform away from her take it away from her I just don't give her the oxygen. Let her do it from, from wherever on her own steam, not on the BBC's time and our dollar, because essentially we're paying for that as, as, um, as part of the, the, the BBC uh, licence fee, OK? So we have to take that away from her. Otherwise, otherwise it will be a stage forever forever and a fantastic stage for her. I mean, she cannot complain about that at all. And somebody said on Twitter this week, they said, I'm old enough. They were referring to themselves. They said, I'm old enough to remember a Scottish news broadcast that didn't begin with the words, the first minister says, or the first minister did, or the first minister this or that. And what's happened now is life revolves around the first minister and if you're in that position you're in a very powerful political position in a country it is a bit like i'm not making a direct comparison but the cult of the leader is something you see in other countries such as uh, countries that i don't want to name but i'm sure you can uh, figure out wh what i'm referring to there so the cult of the leader is, is a, something that's developing in Scotland, almost like a cult of Mother Sturgeon as well. And that's because she's just omnipresent. She's omnipresent. You put on the television, it's her. You open a newspaper, she's there on page one, two, three, seven, nine, fifteen. She's everywhere, you know, omnipresent. And that's why, if support is growing for them, that's simply why. It's just as a consequence of her omnipresence. She could be spouting nonsense, but so long as that's all you see, then that's all you hear. And eventually people get persuaded by it. So the first thing is just to take away those platforms that she has. And if you can't take them away, find other platforms to express the, the truth, the unionist point of view, the unionist truth. Um, give a few people who are waving their Ross is saying no need for these daily broadcasts um, uh, another person there thinking they're a great idea because they're a supporter of the SNP of course if you support the SNP you love it it's the best thing you could possibly get the best thing you could possibly get if you're a supporter of the SNP is your dear leader on the television all the time it must be so exciting for you guys Anyway, you know, you could blame you could blame central British government for this because they did 
instead of seizing control of the crisis, they devolved the crisis. So that meant that there would be several solutions presumed. And it also meant that they were giving a stage to the devolved assemblies to posture on this particular matter. So who knows if that was the right move at the start. We believed it was the wrong move. We continue to believe it was the wrong move. Time Time will tell, but certainly the British government did let an opportunity for a united approach slip through their hands. And will that ultimately be seen as a major failure or not? Time will tell. Sandra said, we know exactly what you're referring to. It's awful and wrong in so many ways. Absolutely. I'll give a wave to another person. They are good to see. Somebody saying if the United Kingdom closed its borders, the virus could have been stopped. That's, that's also true. And, you know, somebody was saying to me earlier about how come, you know, we've got all these boats coming over from, from uh, Calais. And why can't that be stopped? That seems like an amazing, an amazing thing that's going on, that something's gone terribly wrong, that the British government can't stop that and just has to effectively act as a ferry service, that's really, something's gone seriously wrong. You know, whether it's with the laws that were made on these matters, or whether it's in dipl diplomatic relations or whatever, but it's seriously wrong when we are shipping in literally hundreds of people daily to the, to the United Kingdom, when they could just simply be staying in France Somebody, yeah, yeah, I don't know what the percentages of people with COVID or anything like that are, but it's certainly, you can't have a lockdown, but at the same time be importing people and keeping the borders open. So the whole thing is really, really quite, quite uh, crazy in, in some ways. And, you know, I'm just going to end the, 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 the little COVID bit here by, by, by saying to young people, and by young people I mean uh, well, take your pick, but especially children, you know, you must look, if you're a little child, if I was a little child at the moment, looking at the adult world, I would think that adults have all gone stir crazy, you know, the little children are meant to look up to adults for, like, guidance and authority, and it just seems like the adults are behaving extremely weirdly, so... I would say to little children, don't let that bother you. Like, the adults will be normal again in time. But uh, just please don't uh, don't be scared about the world or the life because it's like almost like the adults are trying to scare you into being afraid of things which don't actually exist. Now, if you're... Basically, if you're below the age of 50, it doesn't affect you. If you're between 50 and 80, you have to be careful, obviously, because you're getting older. But the people who are at most risk are the people over 80, as they're always at risk, unfortunately, just because of their particular age. And the people over 80, really only if you have underlying health conditions, will you be, will you be somebody that needs to take precautions. But for everybody else, and especially for young people and children, there is no risk. There is no risk. So... If you're a child, don't be scared of the world because I know that sometimes little children growing up can be scared of all of this sort of thing that they don't understand. Just don't be scared. Don't be scared. And just just be strong, basically. And I have to say that because I see little kids like walking about. Their parents have got them in masks and everything like that. If I was a little child wearing a mask, I'd be scared out my brain about what this world is coming to. So what I'm saying is just don't don't go along with that. If you're a kid, don't go along with that. Anyway, enough said about that. I want to talk about something really, really positive that we did. Any news on the draconian hate speech law? I'm going to speak about that later. That's coming up. There is some news. A lot of people still are coming forward, uh, really opposed to it, but going to get on to that shortly. Uh, Morwina, there, good to see you. Just hate to uh, hate children won't understand and it will be scary for the little ones absolutely and they're just being like it's like 
it's like just living in a massive chitty chitty bang bang film you know if you're a little kid it must be just like this is too much or what was that other one uh the the Willy Wonka factory you know these films that came out in the early 1970s that were like totally weird and if you're a little kid growing up you were like they they traumatized you for the next 30 years it must be just like that like a massive chitty chitty bang bang film that you're stuck in <laughs> uh yeah, what was I talking about? Um, somebody said, well said, thanks. Uh, somebody saying, just don't let them watch the news. Uh, that's true. Don't let... In fact, adults shouldn't watch the news. I recommend that you stop watching the news because the news contrives to frighten you, to make you feel small and alone, to make you feel that your life isn't your own. Love quoting that line from Morrissey from his song, Spent the Day in Bed. <laughs> but great wisdom in that song, no question about it. Stop watching the news, because you can wake up in the morning and it's this, the, the sun shining, the birds are singing, open the window, nice breeze comes in, and you're happy as Larry, you switch on the news and you see Nicola Sturgeon, and for the rest of the day, you are livid, okay? So, it's about what information you take into your mind. OK, what information comes into your mind? And if you're just allowing stuff that makes you annoyed to come into your mind, then you'll go through life annoyed. So you have to moderate it. And then when you do uh, engage with it, you need to have a certain stand off attitude to it and try to apply your own brain. You know, the old, uh, Peter Simple, they used to say that it would be better to do anything than to watch the television news. It would be better to cut off the buttons of your shirt and then sew them back on again, was the example that he used. Just do anything other than watch the mainstream news, which basically mainstream news is a massive propaganda machine. And when it gets a bee in its bonnet against something that it doesn't like, then it will go all out. When it gets something that it likes, it will go all out. And you see that, that like with their anti-Brexit attitude of the entire mainstream media. You see it with the pro-BLM stuff, you know, uh, which it is just crazy. They push that crazily, the entire mainstream media. Um, and they've got the power to do that. But the power is weakening to an extent because more and more people see through them and more and more people have come to understand that for, for years now we've been, we've been fed under, uh, a, a vision of life which isn't entirely accurate. And we've been led along, led along. Aye, so going back to what I was saying about our fantastic work last, last, uh, last Sunday, it was the 200th anniversary to the day of, of the Union Bridge, which connects Scotland with England across the Tweed. The 26th of July, 1820, was when it was opened. And, you know, we had been noticing a lot of people, uh, Scottish nationalists, going down to the border, so-called, at the motorway junctions and waving yes flags in the face of the motorists and telling so-called people, English people to stay out of Scotland, England out of Scotland, that sort of stuff, and swearing at them as well. And that got a lot of uh, publicity in the newspapers and in the media. And they got publicity because they were being nasty, okay? It's almost like you get more publicity if you're nasty. That's a bad thing, but it seems to be the case. So they got all that nasty publicity. So we thought, well, what can we do to basically assert that the so-called border is not really a border? It's actually just a, an area of our Great Britain. And we thought, we don't want to go on a motorway or stand up motorway because that just makes you look kind of retarded. And it's a bit cringe. And it's also dangerous, you know. You could be, uh, you know, you could be distracting the motorists. So we don't want to do anything like that. So we thought, well, do you know what? This is a really good opportunity. The 200th birthday of the Union Bridge is coming up. We'll go down there and we'll stand in the middle of the Union Bridge as it crosses the Tweed and 
we were going to try to do a live broadcast, but when we got there, the, there was no upload. We just couldn't connect the Wi-Fi properly. We did about a, a an eight-second video, which was largely looking at the pavement, and then it scanned over to a massive great big Union Jack, and you heard me saying, is it working yet? And then it went dead. But nevertheless, that got over 7,000 views and hundreds of comments. <laughs> so it just shows you, just shows you how... Uh, how social media can work. Anyway, what we did do was we took a wee film of our 10 activists crossing over from the English side to the Scottish side, waving all the flags of the home nations and a big lovely Union Jack at the top and also our AFFG flag at the front. And that's had thousands of views on Facebook and on Twitter. And so that was like a nice positive thing that was done. And in fact, somebody made a really nice comment on Facebook. They said that is making a profound statement of substance in the face of SNP nihilism. Such a good phrase, which we incorporated into our social media posts. We were making a profound statement of substance in the face of SNP nihilism. And we did actually send some pictures to the Southern Reporter and to the Berwick Advertiser. I haven't seen if they've been published. If anybody's watching who uh, gets the Southern Reporter or the Berwick Advertiser, please have a look in this week's paper. And if the report is in there, uh, can you take a photograph of it and, and send it to us, please? That would be that would be much appreciated. Um, Marion saying, so right what you say about the shopping, it's no longer the pleasant experience. No more impulsive shopping, absolute essentials only. Just don't feel comfortable and it's sad for business. That's absolutely so. I mean, shopping is about just about the comfortable experience and just enjoying it and just going and having a life, basically. It's Saturday, it's Saturday afternoon, I'll go into the shops and wander about. That's what people always do and that's what people in cities do um, on Saturday afternoons, just to enjoy it. They don't want to go in to be regimented, to be regimented around in circles and told to do this or told to do that. It's it's um, we understand, of course, that we have to do this at the moment because it's the law. But it's that's no way to that's no way to build the high street back up again. I mean, to build the high street back up again after this is going to take some it's going to take some serious policies, which are going to have to involve basically abolishing business rates. Basically, that's the first thing you have to do if you want to get the get the high street back up and running again. Um, yeah, so our Union Bridge event, you know such a good place to do it as well because the Union Bridge at both ends it's got uh, the uh, parapets I guess you call them and there's a design on there on both ends at the Scottish end and at the English end of the rose and thistle entwined and a Latin motto that is vis unita fortior which means in union strength is yet stronger in union strength is yet stronger. So what a fantastic motto and what a fantastic bridge. Now that bridge is actually going to be uh, renovated uh, th starting from this August. It's going to take about 15 months and they're going to actually take it down, would you believe, and build it back up again. At least the bit in the middle they're going to take down and build up again. That was our understanding of what was explained to us. So it's going to be built even stronger than it was before. What a great metaphor for the Union, building it up to be even stronger, renovating it and then building it up to be even stronger. And in a way, that's our kind of mission here, generally, for the Union and for the United Kingdom, our, our country. Another comment that we received on Facebook as a result of our video was completely different atmosphere to the cult on the Berwick Border motorway last week. The Union fights back. Splendid. So that's the sort of stuff that we're doing. And we're always coming up with these kind of clever ideas. And if you've got any ideas, cultural as well, which we historical things as well. 
sense of the past and bringing the past into the present in order that it can strengthen us for the future goal. Somebody being quite uh, philosophical, saying this too will pass, hopefully sooner rather than later. Um, somebody saying, I think we should all have a profile pic. Can't get the rest of that. Rose and thistle entwined. Uh, yes, a profile pic such as rose and thistle entwined. Well, do you know what? Uh, just the Union Jack. The Union Jack, quite thing. Uh, entwinement of the Christian crosses of St. Patrick, St. George and St. Andrew. And together that is in itself a powerful statement of unity. And we sell that in our shop. If you go a lot, go to a forceforgood.uk, go to the shop, you'll get this wee flag badge, which is this bad, this flag up here, created by the Scotsman James the Seventh, and we've also got our Union Heart, which says a force for good through the centre of it, and that's selling well. Also, people buying that for each member of the family, in fact, which is a lovely thing, a lovely thing. Yeah, so Boris Johnston came up to Scotland last. Uh, 10 days ago, what, what, whenever, and we made mention of it last week. And last week we said, you know, why weren't there people in Orkney, even just like two or three people who maybe supported him, why didn't they just go out with a Union Jack flag or a welcome Boris on a piece of cardboard? Because if they had, they would have got attention from the media, as it was the six or seven Scottish nationalists got all the attention, making it look bad for us unionists. And somebody came back to me with a very good point, and he said, Alistair, most people don't even have a union jack in the house, so they're not going to be able to get one at short notice. And that made me realise that, goodness me, you know, we are a force for good. We sell union jack flags. We sell three by two union jack flags. And they're uh, extremely, extremely good quality. And importantly, they've got a hem, an open hem here. So you can put uh, a stick or a bit of bamboo or whatever into it and fly it. Okay, so there's no problem about adjusting this or putting it onto anything. And it's, we had these custom made for us a lot of them custom made. So if you want to buy a Union Jack flag, it, it, incredibly cheap, we'll send you this. We'll also send you a copy of our magazine at the same time, Union Heart. Just go to our shop at aforceforgood.uk and you can get one there. And we'll put up there, somebody's put up the link, Union Jack flag for sale. Click on that and get one so that if you do need short uh, time activism, like somebody says, you know, uh, can you come out tomorrow, bring your flag, you'll have a flag, you'll have a flag in your drawer, ready to go. That's, that's what you want to do. And another, if you're not a flag wearer, you might be an umbrella user. And we also sell these Union Jack umbrellas, which they're almost as good as flags, actually, because if it's raining, you put this up and, and believe me, the media will take photographs of it because this is the thing with the media, is that they want a picture of people doing something and they want a colourful picture. And there's nothing more colourful than standing with a Union Jack umbrella. And we've had several of our activists get into, certainly get into, um, get onto online newspaper reports be simply because they're carrying a Union Jack umbrella. And again, you can get that at our shop at aforceforgood.uk. But these are essential tools of activism. So if you need a short notice to go out with something, you'll have a flag and you'll have the umbrella and you might even have a few badges or whatever. And of course, you might have shirts as well. We have our Scottish and British T-shirts. And I'm not giving you a big sell here. I'm just saying this is how you get organised. You know, we are helping you to get organised. We understand that not everybody can be organised, but we'll help you to get organised. We'll have the stuff for you. Um, so do please go to our shop. There's the, the link to the Union Jack umbrellas has been put up. Andrew says, I fly my Union Jack with pride. Good, good. 
Uh, Morwina says, thank goodness for a force for good. After a week of rubbish, I get new hope watching you on Saturdays. Restoring my faith, good is coming. Absolutely, absolutely. We are giving you the positive message, the positive message of unionism um, and breaking down all the stuff that the Scottish nationalists do to try to to try to try lower our morale. Because if they can just keep chipping away and keep chipping away and we see nobody standing up for us, then we, the, the human tendency is just to say, oh, let's just give in, you know, let's just forget it. But when you see hope, when you see other people doing stuff, you're like, yes, we're fighting back. And that's what we are about and some good, uh, another good thing as far as we're concerned as well this week is last week um, we, when Boris came up, we had heard that he had been suggesting relocating Westminster to York perhaps for a few years. And we noted that that was uh, policy number 12 in our wee book. Well, goodness me, this week we hear another thing. Boris is saying that they are thinking about holding British cabinet meetings in Edinburgh. Well, what do you think was number 13 here of our suggestions? Hold British cabinet meetings at devolved assemblies. These could be once a year at Holyrood, Cardiff and Stormont. These devolved assemblies already have the infrastructure, resources and security in place. This would help to integrate them with the British Parliament in the public mind rather than giving the impression that they are in opposition to each other. So, it would just be good if he picks up on the other 21 suggestions in our 23 policies to strengthen our union, which is in our wee book. It's a pocket book, size A6, full colour, divided into four parts, how we came together, the benefits of the UK, exposing the indie myths and making a better Britain. And that's a 56-pager. It's only a fiver. It's only a fiver. So order your copy today and we'll put it in the post for you tonight. Marjorie's saying hello. Uh, May says, greetings from Fife. Good to, good to see you, May. Somebody's saying, why don't you spend the money on food banks? Do you know, see, the SNP, that's what they're like. They're so... Like, you could, you give them the moon, they're like, why did you give the moon to me? Why didn't you give the moon to a food bank? You know, they'll just never be satisfied with anything. And they love the little talking points like food banks and stuff like that, as if, you know, many of us already do give a lot to charity as well. Do you know what I mean? Um, yeah, this guy's never, never going to be happy. Uh, I don't even understand that point, but he didn't think it would be a good idea to uh, hold it cabinet meetings in Hollywood, it would be a very good idea, a very good idea, especially if it annoyed people like you. It would be brilliant. And it already does. Just talking about it's already annoying the SNP, and that's what we love. That's what we're good at. Unionist parties started the food banks. Um, well, I think it was started by the Trussell, the Trussell Trust, which was a religious charity, but whatever. I'll take your word for it. Maybe it was the Tory party. Um, I should say we're not, we're non-party political. Um, we're simply talking here about the Tories because they happen to be the government, just as we talk about the SNP that happens to be the administration at Holyrood. Um, so if you're watching on Twitter, please retweet us, because if you retweet us with a positive comment, then that will enable us, if you commented with a positive comment, that will enable us to retweet your tweet to 29,500 people and we're going to be at 30,000 people within the next two or three days which is amazing progress amazing progress so please retweet us with a positive comment and we will retweet you to 29,500 people and that's a good deal because that gets you seen and it gets us seen and it helps to boost our views as well so everybody benefits it's a win-win it's a 360 win as somebody says Give a, a wave there to the folk who are watching. A 360 win. Who says that? That's a good phrase. Yeah. So, I said I was going to talk about the the, the so-called hate crime laws, which are actually the anti-free speech laws. 
and they're coming up. Um, well, what the situation at the moment is that the public consultation has ended. They'll look at all the good ideas and very possibly they'll just bin them all and they'll do what they wanted to do in the first place. But let's hope that they don't. Let's hope that wiser minds prevail and let's hope that the opposition parties at Holyrood are able to hold the SNP uh, feet to the fire on this one. Um, uh, somebody's saying they don't know how to buy a wee book. Well, you can send a cheque to our business address, A Force for Good, AFFG Productions Limited, or you can uh, just click on the wee book for sale link there, which you should be able to do if you've got a credit card. But otherwise, AFFG Productions Limited, check to our our address, and that's fine also. So the hate, the anti-free speech laws, have been getting a lot of criticism from the right people, it should be said. The Police Federation, um, let me get this right, what do they call themselves? The Scottish Police Federation said the hate crime, so-called, bill could mean officers, quote, determining free speech. Well, of course that's what it does. It doesn't mean it might, that's what it does. It requires the police officer to decide whether or not a so-called crime has been committed by using an abusive, threatening or insulting word intended to or likely to stir up hatred. So you're essentially making the police officer uh, the judge and jury, really. And if that officer decides that a crime essentially has already been committed, they will then file that as a hate crime and it will go to the procurator fiscal. If they don't think the balance of evidence is sufficient, they'll record it as what's called a hate incident. But they'll record it in some way using this word hate rather than free speech incident. It's like a free speech crime is what it is, but they call it a hate crime. It's a free speech incident, but they'll call it a hate incident. So we looked into this and we, we came out against the part one which creates this whole notion of aggravated offences. Um, and we came out against the idea of trying to make a crime without having the guilty mind, which is what you do when you say that somebody is likely to have done something. You can't say that because it's likely to stir up hatred, even though you did not intend it. That's a crime without the guilty mind a crime without the intention, which is against Scots law principle, as we pointed out. And as we point out in our article, free speech for Scots, which there it's just posted, bang, straight away. It's up there already. Thanks for that. Thanks for that. So uh, we also said if this is going to go through, um, if it's going to go through, then basically uh, it should have a very strong a very strong freedom of expression clause and somebody's saying that the SNP supporters because they're loving it because they know it's going to try they can use it to stop their opposition you see these people these people like what I was talking about you know the the the, the cult of the leader they w want everybody silenced unless you agree with them and they'll call you nasty names as a consequence oh well he, he's silenced because he was hating or he's silent because he was being racially aggravated or whatever. Oh, just rubbish. Oh, just rubbish. That's just terms in order to silence you. And um, the man behind all of this, of course, Hamza Yusuf, he, uh, somebody sent us this recently, just he has said that Opposing Scottish government policy, so-called Scottish government, SNP administration, opposing SNP administration policy is absolutely not a criminal offence. And you're like, oh, good, good. And then it goes, unless, unless this is expressed in an abusive and threatening manner with an intention to stir up hatred or where it is likely that hatred will be stirred up. So in other words, opposing Scottish government policy opposing SNP administration policy, will be an offence. It will be an offence if Hamza Yusuf and his friends consider it to be expressed in an abusive manner, which is likely to stir up hatred. That's very serious, man. That's very serious. That is them setting themselves up 
as beyond reproach. And this must not happen. This must not go through. And if it does, we'll just have to wonder where the country's going from there. But there's surely, there's surely a lot of SNP people who are upset about this. I know there's the hardcore who think it's great because they don't really understand the concepts of free speech and they, uh, they just like the idea of their point of view dominating. And believe me, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's, that's something that does exist in the Scottish psyche. And I say Scottish particularly because of our, our history going way back, you know, when, a, when Scots get an idea, they're right, you know, they're right. Everybody else is wrong. <laughs> and when it's a bad idea, that's a problem. That's a problem. And this is a very bad idea. So we'll have to just see and we'll have to appeal to those sensible Scottish nationalists. We'll have to appeal to the sensible Scottish nationalists to say, look, your party is involved in suppressing free speech in Scotland. Do you support that you know and we're hopeful that there's plenty of people in scotland who do not support that we believe there's plenty of people in scotland who will support freedom of speech and who'll be opposed to this bill we just need their voices to be heard and to be articulated by our politicians but here's the thing with our politicians many of our politicians have bought into all of this already you know, they're, they're already on the same page as Hamza Youssef, and that's politicians across all the parties. They already believe, for example, that it's appropriate to have categories of people who get special protections, what we call the protected species categories. That's absurd. You shouldn't have that. That came in in 1998, and there was a lot of debate about that. No, no, it's not right to have these protected categories, because... Because a crime committed against somebody is bad, regardless of that person's characteristics. You can't give a harsher sentence to somebody because of the person upon whom he did it, all else being equal. All else being equal, the aggravated category concept is, is wrong uh, for, for adults. Uh, where all else is equal, other than these uh, these protected so-called characteristics. So unfortunately, a lot of our politicians are already on that page, which means that they're already restricting freedom of speech in relation to such protected characteristics. They're already there, unfortunately. So unless they can rethink it all, then a lot of this is going to go through because we haven't yet had the revolution of mind to get rid of all of that kind of stuff. And I'll give you an example. This week, this week, um, somebody had put up, a, somebody had paid for an I Love J.K. Rowling poster in, in Waverley Station in Edinburgh. Now, of course, J.K. Rowling's a famous... Uh, daughter of Edinburgh or denizen of Edinburgh certainly and uh, so that's why it was in Edinburgh and she's also come in for some stick from various lobby groups who don't like her particular views on things and you can argue it whatever way however Network Rail removed that poster after one day and they they used the excuse that it did not meet its code of allowing advertising that is likely to support or promote one viewpoint over another. It was too political. They didn't support and they don't want adverts which support or promote one viewpoint over another. But the point is, Network Rail do this all the time anyway. As this lady who paid for the poster said, she goes, I thought it was rather ironic that they, Network Rail, are tweeting about political statements and how they're opposed to them when they have a rainbow to celebrate pride as their own logo. As far as I'm aware, that's a political movement and it will have opponents in the United Kingdom. So, I mean, that's a fair point, whatever you may think about those, those, particular, those particular groups. So why did they remove the J.K. Rowling 
support supporters poster. And uh, this lady as well, who put the poster up, who paid for the poster, she says, you know, there's network rail are trying to pretend that they're neutral, but she says it, they're clearly not because they're taking a position by removing my poster. It's not neutral to take down something based on my intention, she says. So when groups take it down and they say it's because they're being neutral, they're not being neutral, they are taken aside. And um, But why are they taken aside? They're taken aside because that is one of the protected groups that they don't want to upset. And that's what happens when you have a legal code that you're not allowed to upset certain protected groups. All that happens is they get their way. They get their way all the time because debate has been constrained to such a point that nobody wants to do or say anything that will upset that particular group. Whatever the, the, the rights and wrongs of that particular group may be, they get a certain domination in law over the rest of the people. And that's that's not right. You know, you can argue these points of the these people's points one way or the other, but they shouldn't get they shouldn't be protected in law to get their way, which is essentially what happens once you set up a system which says that you, you and you are all protected in some way. It's essentially giving them special favours. Special favours, as they say. So, we've got a good uh, example of that, but I'm not going to go into that at the moment because uh, we're going to write up an article exactly about what we've just said. So, actually, already written. We'll get that published. Um, but it's an important point. Bring in a wave there to you guys. Thanks for coming in. Thanks for coming in on, on Facebook and also on Twitter. And so please go to a forceforgood.uk forward slash blog where you'll see all of our articles and we're generating a lot of good content, a lot of good content on there. Somebody, that's a, uh, unionists should be protected because they're going extinct. <laughs> that's actually quite a funny joke. That's the best comment that you've made. That's the fellow that was making all the, all the SNP comments. That's actually a funny comment. Okay. So well done for that. Well done for that. No, write that one down. Write that one down and remember to use it again. So, you know, today is the 1st of August and this was the day in 1714 where one of the most important women in British history passed away. She was the first Queen of the United Kingdom. We're talking about Anne, of course, who was in many ways a very tragic character because she tried to produce an heir and she tried, she lost 17 children in the effort. So that, uh, but she, she did her best, but she was not able to produce an heir and she died this day, 1st of August in 1714. And it was concern over her in, in a concern of the fact that she wasn't able to produce an heir that led also to the union of 1707 because both the English and the Scots were very keen to have a Protestant on the throne and they're casting about for who can we get on there and the English had said that they would have Sophia Electress of Hanover who was related to uh, James the Seventh. And the Scots would probably have accepted that as well. But being Scots, we have to be different. So we said, no, 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 we're not going to accept that. We're going to come up with our own person, um, which would probably have been the same person anyway. But that created a big, a big concern because the English were like, oh, no, are they going to put a Catholic on the throne? Which they weren't going to do, really, all things considered. So that, that, um, all, that um, all that controversy also pushed towards the, the Union of 1707. Um, what happened actually in the event was that Sophia Electress of Hanover died a few weeks before Anne. So what they had to do was they had to go to Sophia's firstborn 
boy who was George I, who became the first Hanoverian king of the United Kingdom. Um, so that was today. Uh, the 3rd of August is British Columbia Day. British Columbia, so named by Queen Victoria to separate that area of the uh, western seaboard from American Columbia, which we now know today as Oregon and, and Washington. And if you haven't seen it, the British Columbia flag is a stunner. It's a stunner. Um, and its motto is beauty that never diminishes. And it is uh, consists of a crown um, representing the links of Britain and the monarchy of Canada. And the lower part is the setting sun on the background of blue and white waves representing its geographical location beside the Pacific Ocean. So British Columbia, what an amazing British flag it's got. Check it out. Check it out. Um, on the 4th of... On the 4th of... Uh, August, we had uh, Noel Chavas who passed away and he was a double VC winner. Uh, he fought... As, well, he fought in the medical corps. He was part of the medical corps with the Liverpool Scottish. And uh, he twice won the Victoria Cross as a consequence of his efforts to rescue injured men out in the, out in the battlefields. And he's got a really nice statue in Abercrombie Place in Liverpool and he's dressed in the uniform of the Liverpool Scottish. You can check that one out as well. Um, on the 5th of August, the British Empire was effectively founded in 1583 um, when Sir Humphrey Gilbert claimed new found land as what was then England's first overseas colony under Queen Elizabeth I. And... Uh, so Newfoundland was Britain's first colony, although today Bermuda is our oldest remaining colony. Um, also on the 5th of August, the Act of Security was passed by the Scottish Parliament in 1704. And that was the one I was talking to you about earlier when I mentioned that the Scots set up this edict called the Act of Security, which would be that they would choose the monarch and um, rather than just go along with what the English thought that they wanted to do. And uh, that led to that led to conflict because obviously England was upset about that. And uh, the Queen's representative in Scotland uh, refused to give that royal assent. But eventually, eventually the English got round to it because the Scots said that they would take their soldiers out of the Duke of Marlborough's army. So the English were like, oh crikey, in that case we'll have to, um, we'll have to go along with it. We'll write about that. It's an interesting period of time. Uh, but at the end of the day, events actually overtook it all and we just moved to, to a union anyway in 1707. 6th of October... Great British girl's birthday, Jerry Halliwell. Uh, we love her attitude and we especially remember her Union Jack dress that she wore on the 24th of February 1997, um, which was quite uh, important that year because we were moving in September of that year, we were moving to a uh, referendum which was threatening to destroy the United Kingdom, the devolution referendum. And so it was good for us unionists to see in the popular culture the Union Jack, some of us for the first time, for a long time anyway, since perhaps the 1970s. And, um, and so other things going on include the death of the man who brought Cleopatra's needle to the United Kingdom, Erasmus Wilson. However... What we're going to say is all of that stuff is regularly put out on our Facebook every day. 
we have a British history thing usually about uh, in the morning just this day in British history sometimes we have a couple of those and we just help people to 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 get a feel for the past and to get a feel for what has created us today as the great Britons that we are in this great kingdom of united Britain the great kingdom of united Britain as we sometimes like to say so check us out please do check out our wee badge in our shop and as I was saying please do get yourself a Union Jack umbrella or our Union Jack flags from our shop so that you're ready to go when activism calls when duty calls you'll be ready to get straight in there and please do get yourself a copy of the wee book it's essential reading for all unionists and this will be the first of other books and pamphlets that we'll produce but this is the first one at the moment and it's a real cracker and it's only a fiver it's only a fiver ladies and gentlemen it just remains for me to say thank you very much for watching we'll be here next saturday with our 19th saturday street stall and we'll be standing up strong for the united kingdom for our great kingdom of united britain and god bless the united kingdom and god save the queen <laughs>